Okay, well, hello again. We're here at Bon Air First Baptist. I'm Eric Pacheco, moderating once again with Bo Adams, uh, one of the elders and deacons, and uh, senior pastor Kenny Rogers, as always. And you're continuing your series on the uh, pastoral epistles. And uh, in person, I've missed several of them, but uh, the series uh, is on the epistles. It started with an introduction to Paul that you did for several weeks, and that was summertime. Right. And then... Um, you're, you're moving on after that to, to the letters to Timothy and Titus, really. You've, you've gone through 1 Timothy so far, and now you're, you're in the sec, we're in the second chapter of, of 2 Timothy. Mm -hmm. uh, any, anything you want to frame as far as uh, so far thematically for this book or anything to, to add to the context of what we're going to be discussing with regards to the, the words and the truth? Well, the purpose is to strengthen Timothy for the task of shepherding the flock, which includes protecting them from the false teachers. Mm. And it has 30-something commands in the book, and it really starts rolling uh, at the end of chapter 1 and then into chapter 2. Uh, like this morning, I, I forgot the count, but there was, it was five or six commands. I mean, there okay, were yeah. several I commands. Remember, yeah. And so it's... It it's, it's comes down to being a very uh, hands-on mm. kind of theology sure. as to, okay, th this is what you've got to do. Mm. I mean, this isn't just who you are, but because of who you are, this is what you need to be doing, mm. and this is how you need to do it. And I think this in this morning's message, the how is as important as the what. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I think you even touched on a little bit of why, right? Yeah. But we'll, we'll get through that. I, I did think it was uh, intriguing and always, you know, coincidental is not the right word. Providential is, is a lot more accurate. But the, how you, you did the series prior to this one was on what is the church, and then you started in the pastoral epistles, and it's kind of more of a practical nitty-gritty on, on how to tend to the church. It really is, yeah. That's exactly right. Well, you, you started the sermon with a petition to know um, our subject and to be known by our subject. Is, is what you, you mentioned, at least in the second service. So what is the subject, and, and how do we best know it? The subject is, of course, the Scriptures. Okay. And uh, in, in, in a broader sense, the subject is God. Mm -hmm. But we know God through the Scriptures. I mean, we, we have common revelation, but then we have special revelation. And as believers, we have a special, special revelation because the Holy Spirit makes the Word come alive mm -hmm. to us. But still, it doesn't come alive to us by osmosis or by... Uh, some kind of transcendental thing, it comes alive to us as we read it okay. and take time to study it. And then the more we read it and study it, the more it takes hold of us. Mm. So the more we know God, the more we become gods, if that makes sense. No, not, not gods. Possessive. Plural. God right, exactly. apostrophe S. Yeah, exactly. We, yes. we belong to God. That is yes. right. Yes, the more we belong to God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you did start the passage with a charge, well, not you, sorry, Paul starts the passage with a charge not to, to wrangle about words. Um, and so, you know, get right into it. How, how, do we, how do we know if we're doing this, and how do we avoid it for both of you, really? I mean, well, I guess thing, what is wrangling? Let, let's start there. What, what is wrangling about words? Yeah, and it is an idea that is striking as we've studied this, how much, to me, that is repeated by Paul. Mm. First Timothy, Second Timothy, yeah. and in Titus, not squabbling about genealogies and foolish talk. And yeah. I guess these lesser things are, full, um, I forget how, not quarreling about words. And it, what, the passage that came to my mind, because, you know, as you indicated, there are, and I'm not, I don't want to jump ahead, but there are fundamental truths that we should certainly debate and discuss and focus on, but there's lesser things that we should not. Right. And when you're talking about that, the, the proverb came to my mind, where the don't answer a fool according to his folly, yeah. or you become foolish like him. But the ne very next proverb is answer a fool according to his folly, so he's not wise in his own eyes. So you've got to be able to be discerning. What are the things that we should engage in and, and focus on and, and teach and stress? And what are the lesser things, or not even maybe the lesser things, that some things are just not profitable at all. Right. And he says, he's just saying, take those off the table altogether, and he mm. condemns those that spread such heresies. 
So I guess it obviously requires wisdom and discernment to know what are the fundamentals that we're not going to uh, compromise and what are the things that we can debate and discuss and reasonable minds can differ. And then on the other hand, what's just pure heresy that has no place within the church. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's exactly right. And it's part of that wisdom and discernment. Again, you go back to something that you cannot replace and you cannot fake. And that is you must know the subject and the subject must know you. Yes. And, and we get that through the scriptures. Exactly. Sure. Well, it is, it, it is interesting, Bo, because the example you gave, it's very similar in this case that we're told not to wrangle about words, but then we go to verse 15, and we're told to be diligent to present ourselves as workmen, accurately handling the word of truth. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, one, one kind of says, you know, hold it back a little bit when it's not of value, but then also present it when it is of value. So any, any, any guides that you can provide for us practically is, I understand that, you know, hey, the more we understand the scripture, the more we understand God, the more we align our hearts with God, the more we're going to be able to do this more effectively. But, yeah. but is, is there something that when, let's say I'm presented with a situation and, and I feel like I might be quarreling, or, but I also feel like I might need to present the truth. I, what am I looking for in myself to know whether I'm doing one or the other? And, and should, what's the cautious conservative way to fall on that? I think you've already answered part of the question. Sure. With the, way you, with the way you phrase the question, okay, what am I going, what am I saying to myself? What mm. am I, what do I think about myself? And Bo, I think the most important thing is, okay, why am I doing this? Right. And, and even if it's a, a gray area that some people would still say that's not something we should focus on, and some may say, like, yeah, this is important, I think even regardless of it, the manner in which you engage in sure. that covers a lot. You know, like yeah. he says in verse 24, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. So even when you're debating or discussing something that, you know, maybe not that fundamental to the faith and really not where you need to focus on teaching so much, but the manner in which if you do it with sincerity and a pure heart and love, out of love, for the other person and wanting to edify them, then to me that would even cover if it's not, first of all, you may be wrong, but mm. even if you present it correct, I mean, even if you have the right heart about it, then sure. it's easier to accept that than, you know, if you're just dogmatic about something that you, you know, need not be dogmatic about. Sure. Yeah, sure. and we tend to be dogmatic sometimes about things that aren't as consequential. Now, I think we should be dogmatic about justification by faith alone. Sure. Uh, through grace alone. I mean, that's something we need to be dogmatic about, but I don't think we should be dogmatic about the end times. Sure. Or, you know, there's other, I guess what you would call tertiary doctrines that divide denominations but need not be divisive in the church at large. Mm. Uh, you know, I mentioned this morning in the early service, you know, I just was kidding about, you know, the Presbyterians. Mm. So, I, I mean, I love Presbyterians and I <laughs> fellowship with many of them I have some differences with them sure but these are not differences that I would would uh, renounce them over I wouldn't I mean I've certainly chosen not to be a Presbyterian but that doesn't mean that I think that they're all wrong or even that I'm all right well yeah so let's go with how do you how do we as Christians how do we deal with the fact that, that there are brothers and sisters that we disagree with and, and understanding that neither of us have a, a perfect understanding of the truth, but obviously we have to have a perfectly useful understanding of the truth. Sure. I, I think it's people that, first of all, believe in the authority of Scripture. Okay. If someone has set aside the authority of Scripture, then we got a major problem with mm. that. Uh, and, and if it's going to be grace-based salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that would be two of my issues. Uh, I think that's good. I, I didn't think of that. But it, as far as is, if you can agree on the source of the truth, yeah, yes, that being Scripture, then, all right, you know, you can have a different view about should I abstain totally from alcohol or yeah. is it, you know, just yeah. things like that. Right. Mm. Um, but as long as you're, you both agree on what the, 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 the ultimate truth is, or I guess the source of that truth, and we you can, 
maybe disagree about how it's presented as far as that goes. But if you're engaging in a debate about somebody who doesn't believe in the authority of scripture, you've got a more fundamental disagreement than whatever issue you may be mm -hmm. um, dealing with mm -hmm. at present, you know. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Well, when, when we get to verse 17, the, uh, the mention there is, is that their talk will spread like, or spread, sorry, like gangrene. And, and at this point, you, you kind of mentioned the internet and social media as an avenue that this could happen through. Is there anything special about social media, or has this always been the threat with any sort of written or communication that's separate from the actual communicator? I think social media makes the problem much worse. There's already a problem. Mm. Social media didn't create this problem. This sure. problem existed with Paul and Timothy thousands of years before social media. Social media has exacerbated the problem because people can can sit where they're not face to face with someone. Yeah. They can type, they, they can go off on tangents, uh, they can be mean spirited. And, you know, it's one thing to be mean-spirited when you're in your little, you know, bedroom closet and you're typing something out and looking at your little, you know, Google searches and all this. It's something else to sit in a panel like this or in mm. front of people and say, hey, this is what I think. And, and you have to be able to defend uh, what you're saying and what you're thinking. Um, and, and, and plus, the, 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 just the medium is, is, is filled with people who are self-absorbed. Sure, no well, I self, mean, the world yeah, is filled with no, that, right? Well, it is, <laughs> but then the, the, the medium, again, takes that to a new level because mm. people now can, can take it, this, this lack of self-awareness and this, this, posi this, this positively, totally 100% self-absorbed, mindset and just display it before the world and have some people say, hey, I like that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Well, it certainly accelerates things. It accelerates <laughs> things yeah. big time. Good word. <laughs> no, Any I'm, thoughts on that? Or I, no, I mean, to me, that's the thing. It, it can, you know, you talk about gang green, like it affects one person, one spot, I guess. Yeah. And then it just spreads. And, and that provides, you know, the internet provides a medium where it can spread so much quicker than before if it had to be done by yeah. verbally, you know, I don't know, it just provides a means that it can spread so yeah, drastically. It, it is interesting that way, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I think back on just some of my seminary class. I remember there was a study on when the, the, script, the Old Testament scriptures were ser first starting to be written down, and, and then the threat was, well, people will no longer memorize them, and they saw it as a big threat to, uh, to the faith. And then, right. you know, of course, the, the printing press while it promotes the Bible, lots of bad things have also been printed. It seems like the medium, as we get to each level, it accelerates it does. the human tendencies, and it, it makes them easier to be widespread, yeah, for the, sure. The, the, the medium in and of itself is not evil. Yeah. Nobody would say that because then there's also a lot of good that comes on the Internet, too. I mean, all mm -hmm. three of us have probably looked at stuff on the Internet to prepare to for prepare this. To prepare for this, sure. Exactly. Sure. So, but you have to be... Maybe we should think about, well, okay, what's the proper use? Well, A, first of all, you should be discerning when you use the sure. Internet. Mm -hmm. You know, check your sources. And two, if, if you ever decide to print something on the Internet, before you hit send, think about how this is going to be received. And, mm. you know, what, how does this reflect upon God? Just like we would before we speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot easier to, to hit send even than when you're in a, a vacuum so to speak, than it is to speak to people that you're face to face with. Yeah, there is certainly a dehumanizing capacity to not interacting with somebody you know. Absolutely. And it, uh, you don't a, act in the same way. That's another good word, dehumanizing. That's a good <laughs> word. Well, good. I'm full of words. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, another thing you mentioned in this section of your sermon was casting your pearls before swine or whatever. Uh, translation you have in Matthew 7, 6 there. How do we know when this verse is applicable to a conversation? At what point do we decide that it's time to not cast our pearls before swine? You don't First have to have all, a definitive answer, obviously. Knowing your audience is the big okay. thing. Yeah. Knowing your audience and, and deciding on the time. And there, there is a time, and, and this sounds mystical, but it's true, 
there is a time when you have to depend upon the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Should I speak or should I not? I think if the Spirit is checking you, and it's not fear. See, there's times when we don't speak because we're fearful, but then there's other times, I think, when we don't speak because we just know yeah. this is not the right time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anything? No, that, that was it. I mean, I guess when you say, how do you know when you're casting your pearls before swan? You think is, <laughs> I mean, to call somebody swan is pretty bold. But yeah, you consider, <laughs> I would say, consider the audience. But also, you can, I think that the Holy Spirit can lead you if, if this is going to be a productive talk or if mm -hmm. it's just right. not going to be sure. uh, a productive conversation, then yeah. there's no reason to. And I think, too, the quote by Calvin helps us kind of alleviate yeah. the term swine. Because we don't know what this person will do in the future. Yeah. We don't know how God is going to deal with a certain person. Only God can really make the ultimate call. Mm -hmm. It's just for us, I think, maybe it's not in God's timing, or maybe it never will be in God's timing. That's just a hard call. Yeah. Well, let's get into, into verse 20. We start in the, the example there. It's given of the gold, silver vessels, but also the, uh, the vessels of wood and earthenware. What is, what is Paul talking about with these vessels and the cleansing with them? Uh, what did Matthew Henry say? Did you read him? I did. Um, he may have quoted um, Paul's use of vessels in Romans 9, okay. vessels for of mercy uh, yeah. and vessels of that. wrath. So it wasn't... Yeah. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, so it's not necessarily like um, where he uses the analogy of, you know, there may be different, like somebody may be in, in the body of the believers, somebody may be a hand or an eye or whatever, and there's yeah. just difference of function. But this was not that way. It was like either, well, you, as your sermon said, converted or not. Right. Yeah. Um, and so when Paul uses such a phrase in, in Romans, it was certainly vessels of wrath versus vessels of mercy yeah and to call it dishonorable too it made it, i believe a distinction christians and non-christians right I, that's the way i took it so basically depending on which vessel you've used your, to clean yourself is is where you're standing on that's a well i'm i think he's saying that vessels of honor can be cleansed further i think i think the idea is the idea of sanctification okay by following up with pursuing Faith, righteousness, okay. peace. So this is this. Sorry, go ahead, Bo. No, no. I think actually a phrase I've read in Matthew Henry is like the first the tree's got to be good before it can produce good fruit. Right. Okay. And so yeah. it is the idea of sanctif. Well, first regeneration, but then sanctification. Right. And and the reason that that this fits in this narrative at this point is because how do you how do you see it fitting in? It does seem a little bit strange. We're talking about how to talk, how to, and all of a sudden it's hey, let's talk about some vessels here. But is it because of the, the discussion previously about soldiers and athletes and farmers, and now we're going into, hey, how you should guard your uh, tongue here? And I, th I think it's because of the analogy of the, or of the statement of the firm foundation, which is the church. Okay. So the, this great house has all kinds of vessels. Uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus are in the great house. Okay. But they're vessels of dishonor. I understand. I, I think that's the way he puts it in there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and and uh, your quote, well, not your quote, I guess actually Paul is quoting, or at least referring back to the rebellion of Korah. Right. And so I went back and read that, and it's interesting that Korah had, uh, and a lot of followers, it wasn't just Korah, he had right. a lot of followers, Levites and others, right. that challenged Moses' authority, and then God showed who was his and who was his not who right. was not but then if you think about paul charging timothy here that you know you need to establish or need to follow the authority that paul is i guess emphasizing timothy's authority and making sure that you know you need to address those who are against your authority and using you know these two individuals as uh, examples i guess hymenaeus yeah. and philetus yep. yeah well, let's talk about that then. How, how do we react differently, or do we react differently to different presentations of untruth? And what I mean by that is, is there a difference? Like, let's say I'm walking through an airport, and I hear just a random unbeliever expressing some untruth about something. Do I have to react the same way as if, for instance, somebody, I see somebody preaching an untruth from a pulpit as a believer? That's a good question. 
I, what would you do if you were walking through an airport and you heard somebody say if, something If it was a stranger, yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, you can't, I don't think you can correct all that you see yeah. around you, and I don't know, <laughs> exactly. again, how productive that would be. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you yeah. shouldn't expect anything more from anomaly. You exactly. should expect more right. from somebody who, you know, is to proclaim truth. And I, I would think they're, they're due to be called out more than mm -hmm. one just expressing unregenerate thoughts you know? I, I think I think that's exactly right and you know you you pick your medium but I think to begin with you would if, if you had the opportunity you would seek that person out privately somehow okay and, and, and then go from there sure yeah sure so well that uh, you know and that that kind of brings up an interesting question that I had in my mind earlier as I was listening to you preach and, and afterwards as I was thinking about this, but what's the difference between just declaring a truth about God to somebody between that, between that and evangelism, between that and discipleship? We tend to almost use them interchangeably in the church in a way that we kind of just almost becomes a, a, our own little language, but if you're from the outside, what's the difference and, and what's, what's the responsibility as a believer? You know, do I have to Again, I'm walking through an airport. Somebody says something untruthful. Do I have to take them under my discipleship? You know, or, or is it just like, or, or if I'm asked something by a random person, obviously I can present a truth to them. Where, how do you navigate this? Where obviously as a father, I have a certain responsibility in my children that, that not exceeds to get that. Of not a, to get of a, killed. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> not to get killed. Not to get killed, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I meant, I meant more evangelistically, no, but yes, I, I, mean, <laughs> I understand this, your yeah, joke, yes. Yeah. I, I think, and, and it does require some boldness if, you, if you're speaking to somebody, especially that you don't know. As I understand your question, so I could speak to them some general truth or some general thought about God himself. Sure. And sometimes um, you're just randomly asked that by people. Yeah. Or, or I might interject it into a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think there's a difference between that and sharing the gospel with someone. Mm -hmm. Because certainly the gospel is going to be more detailed, but maybe you start with that. Maybe that's like a, a lead to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. that's, the, I mean, that's the best I could do with it. I think in church, you're, the difference in church as far as preaching and even, and teaching, I think, goes along with as follows this, is the audience. And in, in, the, in the preaching, you're, it's a proclamation. Okay. It, it's heralding the gospel. Yeah. Okay, in the Sunday school classes, it's, it's discussing the gospel, presenting the gospel, explaining the gospel, so that an unbeliever, if, if there was an unbeliever there, he would certainly not only be hearing it, but he would have the opportunity to ask questions. Mm-hmm. Um, so th those are two things that happen in the church, but then when you're out in the world, and again, you have strangers like the person you're talking about sure. at the airport, you have people that you would see on a kind of a ongoing basis, like a cashier yeah. or your neighbors and then family members. And these people are more difficult because you have a relationship, but you have to sometimes I'll go, I'll go out of a relation, I'll go out of a conversation. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I didn't do a good job of presenting today who I am. Who are you? Okay. Uh, and that goes back to your first what statement. I, what I believe, yeah. but at the same time, I've seen people, I, I've seen people, I was telling a guy this before church, actually two guys before, before the panel started. Yeah. I've seen people come on so strong, so overbearing, and then turn on a dime when the person wasn't responsive, responsive to what they were saying and hurl explicatives at them. And I'm thinking, you're inoculating somebody against Christianity and to a sense. I sure. mean, I, I, the Holy Spirit can overcome anything. But Understood. Yeah. Certainly the Holy Spirit. You're going to turn them off in a, in yeah, a worldly the Holy, sort of way. The Holy Spirit is not in that kind of thing. We're not yeah. called to be jerks. I mean, the message we preach is offensive, but we're not called to be offensive. Sure. Yeah, yeah, we don't have to deliver, deliver it offensively. Sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> Enough said. Not, not a whole lot to, to add to yeah. that. But I, again, I mean, when you refer to, you do have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Sure. Um, and I do think we should seek to be seasonal and know and try to discern when is a good time right. to get maybe further yeah. 
deeper into things, you know, but it does, it just totally depends on the relationship. Sure. I, I wonder in your profession as a judge, do you have times, and, and this might be for a jury, for the benefit of a jury, for the benefit of a courtroom, for the benefit of a lawyer, for the benefit of a defendant, but would you say something in a general way? I know you, I know you have to, that you represent the law and, and all of that, but are there times when you say something in, in, a, in a way that, again, you're not witnessing the people, but you're, you're saying some God fact? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, that probably comes up more with sentencing, whether it be uh, for somebody who violated probation, but they're still going to be on, under supervision and they're going to be monitored and you want to kind of you know, do justice and whatever the punishment is, but also encourage them that they still you know, they're, they're still going to be watched and under supervision. Uh, and, yeah, and, uh, but like with jury and all that, no, but just because they make the decision and, and it's so, the wording of the law is so precise what I provide to the jury. Right. Really I mean, I know you're there that. for guidance more or less and to right. keep things going along by the letter of the law. I was yeah. Just, so, I, yeah, and I can see sentencing because I, when, when the sentencing comes up, then you, there's a lot more freedom for you to, Right, Give and, your opinion. and judging, you know, it's, a, it's the same word, but obviously it's a little bit different. I mean, you got to be wanting to do justice in that case, but particularize that situation. So, if I'm feeling more comfortable, I would, I, yeah, I would share more, or maybe be more a little bit more sincere. But then there's some times where it's just obvious, and uh, it doesn't seem to be the place to right. sure to lead yeah, your pearls. I, I think that is true for all of us. Right, right. Uh, I mean, you, you probably ride in the cockpit with some guys that you can talk to, and some that maybe you can't. Yeah, yeah. You get some weird personalities. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's go to verse 22. What are the what are the useful lusts mentioned? You you kind of mentioned that briefly in the in the. It's not a not literal sense, or at least it didn't appear to be the way that you were mentioning it, but what is that? Kind well, of the, the passions of youth? All sin is our enemy, but I think it's like that, the passions of youth. Okay. And certainly, uh, we can be ensnared by, by fleshly sins, but we can also be, be ensnared by dispositional sins such as pride, quick yeah. to anger, uh, being impatient, those were the things that sure. were kind of antithetical to what he says when he says pursue righteousness. Yeah. It is yeah. interesting, I, I, my little notebook, when I take notes of your sermons, and the last chapter of First Timothy, First Timothy 6, the title of your sermon was Flee and Pursue. Yeah. And the same phrase exactly. is in, in is. Second Timothy here, flee, mm -hmm. youthful passions, pursue righteousness. So like this holy love compared to a you know, the youthful lust. Kind yeah. Of the, the holy yeah. love kind of can't be the cure for mm -hmm. that youthful passion. Yeah. 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 That is interesting. Go ahead. And, and you know, all of us, and, and, and no matter who you love, and the longer you love someone, this is true for your love for Christ. It's true for your love for your spouse. The longer you love them, the more mature your love becomes. Sure. In, in most cases. In most cases. Yeah. 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 In a healthy, in a healthy yeah. relationship. Right. Sure. I'm sure you see some that it doesn't work out yeah. that way, but well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's what you see. I don't see the ones that are that way. Obviously, that's right. you yeah. know, they don't come to me for any reason. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. well, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, <laughs> that is good. Rarely do you get a call when you're in charge of something. Hey, you're doing a great job. You yeah, know? <laughs> that's just. Right. Or you know, we just wanted you to know, Judge, that uh, our marriage is great, and yeah. we don't plan to be seeing you anytime. <laughs> yeah, you know. I remember that just being a lawyer when somebody would call and give me this sordid story, and I'm thinking, what are the chances of this just just ending? Like, and then we just worked it all out, and everything's fine. <laughs> just wanted to let you know. Oh wow! Well. <laughs> like, no, there's something we got to try to fix here. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's look at, at 23 briefly. Paul says, "Refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels." Is this warning? For communications between believers or between believers and unbelievers or both or, or how do we what's the best yes uh, yes all of the above all of the above I okay think. just yeah. within the church in general which you don't know there's converted and unconverted yeah, yeah. in but general I mean, exactly. you shouldn't try yeah. to be a quarrelsome person exactly I, I think not being a quarrelsome person is a good thing mm -hmm. and yet there are many quarrelsome people <laughs> so it goes one thing that, that you mentioned, and, and as we start to wrap it up here, is um, 
when you speak, you should think, how is the, the person going to hear this? And one of the things that it made me think of is when you study hermeneutics, when you're reading what the original author said, you're trying to almost reverse that. What were they trying to communicate to me and, and bridge a cultural gap and, and also a, a, a time gap there? Um, how do we bridge that gap when we're trying to speak? Maybe it's a, because they're an unbeliever. Maybe it's just a different culture. I know that you know the, the, a lot of times we're trying to communicate with people that maybe they're just from a different state or maybe they're from a different country. Is that something that, that you uh, try to take into account when you communicate the truth? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what, what's the context of that person and, and then listen to that person? I, yeah. I think that sharing the gospel is not, although it, the gospel is exclusive, the gospel is Christ came to save sinners. Yeah. And there's no one else who's done that. There's no one else who's going to do that. It's Christ alone. Sure. So that exclusivity offends many people. Sure. And Everybody who doesn't believe really. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we have to, as believers, I think we have to affirm that because that's what the Scripture says. If we believe in the authority mm -hmm. of Scripture, so we, we, we listen to people, but we always have to listen to people through the filter of you're not going to get past Jesus. Sure. Like Paul says in Acts 17, so God once winked on yeah. humanity, but now through the man Jesus Christ, he's calling on all men everywhere to repent and believe mm. in him. Everything's going to be judged according to Christ. Yeah. And we always have to think about that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So just the, the way you communicate, but not the message you're communicating. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. Well, gentlemen, as we close, is there anything that stood out to you that you want to highlight or that I didn't uh, cover in the brief time we had together? I think what Bo said, was it you that said this about the study to show yourself? No, it was, it was someone at lunch today. Study to show yourself approved. He said he'd heard that, but never in, in the context here of y how your words are to be effective, how your words are to be not entangled and okay. worldly and empty chattering. That, that whole thing of putting study to show yourself approved by God in the middle of all of that, I think is just, it's the key. The, the, the two keys to this whole passage are handling the word accurately to study, you know, to show yourself approved and in verse 8, remember Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that is kind of remarkable to me. In verse 8, he tells Timothy, yeah. remember Jesus Christ. And then in verse 14, remind them of these things. So right. it's not like he's saying, Timothy, you've got to figure this out. You've got to you know, come up with some great original truth or, or something that originates within you. Just remind yeah. them what they already know. Exactly. Remind them of the Scripture. Exactly. And, it, and again, I think I said this before, but... If you think Timothy, you know, a great leader in the church, hero of the faith, was encouraged just to remember Jesus Christ, remind him of these things. And how much more, you know, it's not like we have to figure out something new. It's yep. just... Are you sure? Everybody's telling us we do. Yeah, yeah. now, yeah. and that's right. It is, you know... Yeah, no. but it's not. It's, it's not, of course. It's, it's depend on the Lord, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. That's great. Great way to end it, too. Yep. Well, Kenny, I, it's uh, not much of a spoiler, but I assume you can, can continue expositing through the book of uh, 2 Timothy. Yeah, we're going to get to the last days next week in chapter 3. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway. Well, I uh, do appreciate being with you gentlemen once again, and I uh, appreciate uh, you preparing and the time that uh, we spend together. Yep. I appreciate you all doing the same thing. Well, would you mind uh, closing us in a word of prayer? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Help us to always be diligent to handle your word accurately and to speak truth and love, not to be entangled in empty and worldly chatter, but to seek opportunities to speak truth into people's lives that the Holy Spirit might activate that truth by bringing new birth to them and bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen.